Welcome to HSC Economics Made Easy. This video is part of a series about how government policy can impact external stability. Here's a quick recap about external stability. External stability refers to the economic objective concerned with ensuring that our foreign obligations are sustainable and that they're not too volatile or risky. The topic of external stability comes up in topic three of the syllabus. In the syllabus, we can see that the indicators of external stability include the CAD as a percentage of GDP, net foreign debt and net foreign liabilities as a percentage of GDP, terms of trade, the exchange rate, and international competitiveness. For each of these topics, I gave an overview of their trends as well as the causes and effects. I also gave some tips about how to write about external stability in exams. Again, make sure you watch that video. It would definitely also help you if you checked out my balance of payments playlist for more detailed explanations. In this video, I'm going to be answering this question. How does fiscal policy and changes in the federal budget impact external stability? You know, this question has been asked in 2019 and 2021 as an extended response question. And as a marker, I've seen a variety of approaches to this question. What I'm going to do is go through each argument that I've come across and give you a review of how effective each argument is. And just for fun, I'm going to put in a tier list. S tier is for highly recommended arguments. A tier is usable arguments but imperfect. B tier is usable but has notable flaws. C tier and below would just be unusable, so let's not waste time on those. One of the most common arguments I've seen is that the budget deficit contributes to foreign liabilities. Many students oversimplify this by failing to elaborate on the role of government bonds. To finance a budget deficit, the Australian government issues bonds. And with increasing globalization, a lot of the bondholders are foreign investors. Foreign investment in government bonds contribute to net foreign debt and liabilities. The flaw of this point is that the stats don't really support the correlation between the federal budget and net foreign debt. Foreign debt grew despite falling deficits and fell despite increasing deficits. So because of the tendency to oversimplify and the lack of statistical evidence, I'm going to put this one in B. Next is the twin deficits theorem. This is an extension concept that, that theorizes that budget deficits lead to greater current account deficits. This theory is explained using a bit of maths. We start with assuming that the economy is in equilibrium, that total injections are equal to total leakages. We then assume that savings and investments are also in equilibrium so that they cancel each other out in this equation. After rearranging this equation, you'll find that the budget deficit correlates with a current account deficit. The problem with this argument is that it is very theoretical and relies on unrealistic assumptions like the economy staying in equilibrium and savings being equal to investments. So just like the previous argument, there is a lack of real life evidence to support this point. The only benefit that this argument has is that if you can explain this extension concept well, it would make you stand out from other students. For this reason, this one lands in B tier and ranks just a little better than the previous argument. Another common argument that the budget outcome could impact external stability is the crowding out effect. This is when a budget deficit is financed by private sector lending and subsequently decreases the money supply in the private sector. This results in higher interest rates, which then attract more foreign debt inflows and incur more servicing costs. This results in increases in net foreign liabilities, a greater MPY and current account deficit. These financial outflows will also put upward pressure on the Australian dollar and reduce international competitiveness. I would put this one in A tier because it is true that the greatest source of government debt is the private sector. And there are some real world stats that could show the impacts of increased interest rates on those various aspects of external stability. I just can't put it in S tier because there's hardly any evidence of the crowding out effect itself. The stats don't really support that Australia's interest rates increased when budget deficits were greatest. In fact, the opposite is observed. Interest rates are often the lowest when the economy is weak and fiscal policy is expansionary and the budget deficit is growing. All right, coming up is the good stuff. Here are some arguments that are considered to be S tier. One link from the federal budget to external stability that are considered to be S tier is tax incentives for superannuation contributions. These include giving tax deductions or lowering income tax rates for making superannuation contributions. This leads to higher savings ratios, providing capital for investment and therefore reducing the saving investments gap. This results in lower net foreign liabilities. Servicing costs are also lower, improving the MPY and current account deficits. I like this one because of how much evidence there is of the Australian government's efforts to encourage superannuation and improve the savings ratio. 
And then there's also strong evidence for how increased savings improve the MPY and current account deficits, like during COVID-19. The next S tier point is that when the federal budget is used to protect industries, it improves BOGS and the current account. Protection methods like subsidies, tariffs, and export incentives involve the use of the federal budget. It achieves external stability because it helps to increase export revenue and reduce import spending, improving BOGS and the current account balance. I like this one because of how easy it is to explain, especially because you can reuse protection concepts and examples from topic one. You could also bring in the limitations of protection if it's a discuss, evaluate, or assess question. For example, subsidies require government expenditure, so they are a strain on the government budget. Another limitation is that they could reduce international competitiveness in the long term if domestic producers become reliant. Speaking of which, another estio point is that fiscal policy can increase international competitiveness when used to invest into capital goods, such as transport or telecommunications infrastructure or training and education. These capital goods will relieve capacity constraints and increase productivity and efficiency in the economy. This leads to greater international competitiveness, growth in export industries, and improve the BOGS and current account deficit in the long run. This one is simple to explain, and the details of government spending in infrastructure and education is easy to find. And that's why it goes in S tier. The final S tier point is that expansionary fiscal policy worsens the current account deficit. This is because it means that there will be increased disposable income, leading to greater import spending, worsening bogs, contributing to the current account deficit. Company profits will also rise, leading to more dividend outflows, resulting in worsened MPY and CAD. An inflationary boom could also come with higher interest rates, which then attract more foreign debt inflows and incur more servicing costs. This results in increases in net foreign liabilities, a greater MPY and current account deficit. Just like the previous point, I like this one the most because it is a very simple one to explain. There are multiple theoretical links that you could make. And again, details about government spending and expansionary fiscal policy are very accessible. There are also stats to highlight how import spending corresponds with higher economic growth and disposable incomes, which can be the result of expansionary fiscal policy, just like the post-COVID recovery. Lots of stats available for that. And that's why this is S tier as well. So you see, there's a range of ways that you can link fiscal policy to external stability. I did have a lot of fun creating this tier list. If you enjoyed this video, leave a like. Either way, let me know in the comments whether you found this helpful or if you disagree with anything. Before we wrap up fiscal policy, I want to remind you to also revise the limitations. For example, time lags, global influences, political constraints, or conflicting objectives will impact the effectiveness of fiscal policy in achieving external stability. Check out my video on the limitations of fiscal policy for more detail. In the next video, I'm going to be finishing up this trilogy on government policy and external stability. We're going to be talking about microeconomic reform. Make sure you subscribe to the channel and my other socials so you don't miss out when the video comes out. If you'd like more support, contact me for tutoring. You can also get more writing practice by getting my workbook from my website. 100% of the proceeds go to charity. And I look forward to continuing to make HC Economics easy for you. See you next time.